Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, interesting video today. We're going to react to why do we need hadith if the Quran is enough by Numan Ali Khan. As you know, this is a question that I've been asking since I read the Quran by myself. The Quran presented itself to me as a sufficient book. Therefore, I was questioning why would I need any further explanation? Why would I need tafsir or even more? Why would I need hadith? Hadith. Since I started reacting to Hadith videos, I got a lot of critique. But nevertheless, 99% of you guys agreed that this video by Numan Ali Khan is the correct watch, that this video will enlighten us on the importance of Hadiths. So with no further ado, let's have a look. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Anbiya'i wal Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in thumma amma ba'd fa'a'udhu billahi minash shaytan al-rajim fala wa rabbika la yu'minun حتى يحكموك فيما شجر بينهم ثم لا يجد في أنفسهم حرجا مما قضيت ويسلم تسليما رب الشحل صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين Many of you are aware that I have a private Facebook group the purpose of which is to help prepare for the coming month of Ramadan and the intention behind the group is to also allow many of you to interact with me ask your questions and whatever I can help with inshallah ta'ala and try and interact with you back and one of the questions that came up in that group that I would actually by the way like you to join uh, by clicking the, the link inside of this video but one of the questions that I thought was very important important and very pertinent uh, that came up in the group was why do we need anything beyond the Quran if the Quran claims that yep. it's enough that it's clear uh, you know that it's uh, it satisfies the needs for guidance for humanity then what's the point of even believing in the hadith tradition exactly right man it satisfies the needs of guidance for humanity it is clear this is what the Quran says it says it is sufficient of course you will get such a question and therefore to simply disregard everybody that simply wants to obey the Quran and not the hadith is not fair either because if we regard the Quran as the word of God, the literal word of God, and the literal word of God says that it is sufficient. How can you disprove this? And what's the point of even believing in the hadith tradition, the sayings of the Prophet, or the sunnah, the legacy of the Prophet right. So I thought it would be important to kind of discuss this issue because for a lot of people that is a point of confusion. I don't want to make this discussion sure. with you guys academic or overly complicated. I want to just give you four simple points to think about. Nice. Uh, and the first of them is actually man. the Quran's argument argument itself. In my own study of the Quran, I grappled with this issue maybe 12, 13 years ago. And okay. when I did, I realized that some of the strongest arguments, probably the most conclusive arguments in favor of the tradition of the Prophet the Sunnah, the Hadith of the Prophet is actually the Quran itself. An in-depth study of the Quran leaves you with no other conclusion but to rely and to acknowledge the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, I would even consider it inseparable from the Quran or a part of the study of the Quran, not even a separate institution by itself. It's actually part and parcel and inseparable from the Quran. And so I want to share some of that That's with you, inshallah, plan. how that works. The first case that I want to share with you is that this is not a new criticism. This is actually very similar to a criticism brought about by a group of people that accepted Islam in Medina, but were still kind of sort of skeptical. They had their own criticisms. And one of the things they would say is when the Prophet would say something, they would say, well, is that you saying it or is that Quran? So they wanted to make a distinction between the Prophet speaking on his own behalf or saying his words. Uh, as opposed to what was revealed to him in the Quran, يُفَرِّقُونَ sure. بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ They try to distinguish between Allah or separate between Allah and His Messenger And that is responded to exhaustively in many parts of the Madani Quran, the idea that you cannot separate these two entities. So one of them, my favorite place actually, belongs to Surah An-Nisa. In Surah An-Nisa, this passage is about unconditional submission and trust and reliance in Allah. As a matter of fact, the ayah I want to share with you is ayah number 65. But I want to tell you some things about ayah number 66 to help you appreciate what kind of trust Allah expects from His followers. Go. So He says, وَلَوْ أَنَّا كَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ Had we mandated onto them, أَنِقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ أَوْ اِخْرُجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ That you should kill yourselves. Kill your own selves. Or leave your homes, which doesn't make any sense. Allah never commanded us to kill ourselves or leave our homes. But He says, hypothetically, had He even done that, 
no, most people wouldn't have done it because they wouldn't have found that reasonable. Yeah. You know, that reminds us, of course, of Abraham, Ibrahim, this absolutely selfless trust in God, where he would even sacrifice his own son. This is the trust that God speaks of. And then he says, had they done what they were being told to do, it would have been better for them. What Allah is saying is, what He asks you to do can only be based on wisdom, even if it doesn't make sense to you. Sure. That's that point. He never asked us of to course. do any of those things that are unreasonable. But Allah is making the point, you feel so rightful or so, you know, so entitled to be able to question the wisdom behind what Allah says, you're not in that position. Now I want to no. take you an ayah before. How would you be in that position? Your brain is finite, it's absolutely limited. But God, on the other hand, is unlimited, unlimited intelligence, vastness. We are not even to God what an ant is compared to us. We are so small, so unknowing. Of course, we cannot understand his ways. Of course, we cannot understand his intellect, his wisdom. And there Therefore, if he says something, we will have to obey it, of course. This is one of the unique places in the Quran where Allah swears by himself. This is not a norm in the Quran. Yeah, Normally, Allah will swear by, by one Christians. of his creations, calling them as a witness. Like, وَالْعَصْرِ وَالْفَجْرِ وَالْتِينِ وَالْزَيْتُونِ He'll swear by the fig or the olive. He'll swear by the Mount of Sinai. He'll swear by the sun or the moon. You know, he'll swear by time itself. In this particular ayah, he swears, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ Then no, I swear by your master. He swore by himself which is unique. This is very rare in the Quran that Allah will swear by Himself. But He does that in this case. But even when He swore by Himself, acknowledge that He didn't just say, I swear by the master of the skies and the earth, or I swear by the, the creator of all things. He rather said, I swear by your master. And the word you, the ka, is singular, referring directly to the Prophet wasallam. And so he even acknowledged Why? the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the oath that he took by himself. Now what is it, what is so heavy How? that before you even mention it, before Allah rather even mentions it, he takes this. an oath by himself. He says, لا يؤمنون, they have no faith. Now we haven't been told who these people are yet, but whoever he's talking about, do not have an ounce of faith. And he is so adamant about the fact that they don't have an ounce of faith that he will, he's willing to stake his own name as an oath as a credential to this statement, I swear by myself in a sense, they have no faith. I swear by the, your master, they have no faith whatsoever. Who are these people? What renders their faith null and void? That is coming in the rest of this ayah. Our creed, the Muslim creed, is that every word of the Quran is literally the word of Allah. Allah does exactly. not say anything extra. Allah doesn't say anything that doesn't need to be said. There's no, there's nothing that could have been said in a better way. We believe this to be literally the word of Allah. So, but if this is the case, then by that explanation, you wouldn't need anything else. So then you wouldn't need any hadith. Now listen to this literal word of Allah once again. It's Hatta very complicated. Until they make you, you, the decision maker in whatever sprouts among them. Allah did not say they have no faith until they make the Quran, hatta yuhakimul Quran, you know, until they make the Quran the decision maker, fi ma shajara baynahum, hatta yuhakimu ma anzalna okay. ilayka, until they make whatever we reveal to you as the decisive decision maker in whatever has come down to you, uh, in whatever sprouts among them. Nope. He said, until we make you, until until they decide that you are the ultimate decision maker and whatever issues rise among them, the Prophet ﷺ has been elevated to that status in this ayah. All right, fair enough. To play devil's advocate yet again, the only counter argument I can think of is that the Quran itself, what the miracle about it is, is that it is timeless, so to speak, that we still have the Quran. It is recited all across the globe and therefore we still have access to the Quran. We can still read the Quran and Allah gave the promise that the Quran won't be changed. This is an argument that transcends time, so to speak. But then you have the story about Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, and he has authority over those people during his lifetime. This is the way that I understand it. Again, guys, with all due respect, I'm still learning here myself. This is not my final decision here. I'm not saying you have to listen to what I say and this is the truth. No, this is simply my thought pattern. Listening to this presentation here, I simply get the impression that Prophet Muhammad had a certain ruling over certain people during his lifetime and after him you had the Khalifas etc etc you name it other people in charge of worldly matters but the Quran on the other hand transcends even the worldly matters this is the way that I see it and therefore I don't see a contradiction by following the Quran alone why him 
Why not say revelation should be the final decision? Why say the messenger should be the final decision maker? That's the question that is risen, you know, raised by this ayah. And Allah stakes our faith in its entirety on this statement. <laughs> That until we're satisfied with the Prophet ﷺ being the ultimate decision maker in whatever issues come up. And shajar is an interesting word because it's something that is taking place right now and it continues to arise. In other words, until the day of judgment, the ummah will see newer and newer issues sprout and the, the decision maker behind all of them will be our messenger wasallam. Now, ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ He's not done. Your faith and my faith still rests on whatever is going to be qualified in this ayah. And if we don't meet the conditions of this ayah, it's like we have no faith in this emphatic declaration of the Quran. He says, ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتِ Thereafter, they did not find or they won't find inside of themselves, deep inside of themselves, any constriction, any tightness, any discomfort over whatever qadayta, whatever you decided. The Prophet ﷺ once again being put in a position of judgment, of verdict. First of all, come to him for judgment, yuhakkimuka. Then, mimma qadayta, from whatever you have judged in the end, whatever final decision you've made, they have to be completely happy with it. They can't find an ounce of discomfort inside of themselves over what you decided. This is the kind of submissive loyalty we're supposed to have to the Prophet ﷺ. And I use the word submissive loyalty on purpose, it's not accidental. Because by the end of this ayah, Allah says, وَيُسَلِّمُوا taslima," And they continually submit themselves in a way that is, you know, that, that you couldn't have more submission. The word taslima and maf'ul mutlaq, they completely... I would have to read this ayah again. So it is really speaking about submitting themselves to Muhammad and not to Allah. I don't believe this. Utterly and entirely submit themselves and continue to do so. You know, yuslimu islaman, the, the language of it would have been they submit themselves wholly. You okay. mutaslima and the morphology, the spelling of the words is a little bit different. And the suggestion is they continue to do so. They continue to submit themselves. In other words, their submission is going to be challenged time and time and time again. In this ayah, it's not that you and I can raise criticisms about what the Prophet instructed. The, the, the issue here now is that we can't even feel a discomfort over what was given to him. So that's the first thing I wanted to make sure that everybody's clear about the status. Yeah, what was given to him. So yet again, the Quran itself describes Prophet Muhammad as the messenger, as the warner. What was given to him is the Quran. Of the Prophet وسلم, as declared in the Quran. I don't know, man. I don't really see the, the argument. argument and how the Quran makes the Prophet himself inseparable from its verdicts. Sure, absolutely. He is mentioned in there as a messenger and as a warner, as a warner that has been sent to the people, actually to the whole world. Just as Noah has been sent as a warner, just as Moses has been sent as a warner. Absolutely, he fulfills that prophetic role. And now he comes as a warner for the whole world, which means the whole world has access to the Quran. Uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, when he claimed that he's receiving revelation in the very beginning of revelation, and people had skepticism, like, how do we, how are we supposed to believe that this man speaks on behalf of God? You know, how, how sure. the words that he's saying are not his, they're the words of God. You know, what, what makes us rely on him so much? Allah gave various reasons why you should believe in him as a messenger. But one of them I want to highlight is, إِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ No doubt you are committed to a very high character. Your credibility and your character and the way you operate, the way you deal with people, the, your mannerisms themselves are evidence to the fact that you are a messenger of Allah. That you would not cheat people or lie to people or deceive people or take advantage of people and you've never ever done so in your life and your character speaks for itself in itself is a proof to the people around the Prophet ﷺ that he himself, when he says he's a messenger, he in fact is a messenger ﷺ. Yes, you know fair word? enough. Yet again, therefore he qualifies to train Transmute the Quran. If, if you want to summarize this point, uh, it's as though Allah is saying that the character of the Prophet والسلام, is proof of the Quran. So, how can the character of the Prophet والسلام, be insignificant? It is proof of him being the messenger. He is the right man for the mission to recite the Quran. Look at what he does, how he behaves, I don't how he acts, how he speaks, how he is with his family, how he is with his neighbors, what he says to his friends, you know. How he looks, his smile, how can those things become insignificant when they themselves are being used by Allah as evidence to the authenticity of the Qur'an.
So that's I would yet again say used by Allah for the authenticity of his prophethood. There's some some things, a glimpse of the Quranic argument. There are several Quranic arguments, but there are just these a couple for you to ponder about. Related to this question, now we go progressively. The second issue is, well, the Quran is clear. The Quran claims that it's clear. Well, yes. if it's clear, why do you need something else to clarify it? Why what? do you need some outside thing? Yep. And this is again a problem that... And moreover, there is a beautiful passage in the Quran, which reads, It is he who has sent down to you, O Muhammad, the book. In it are verses that are precise, they are the foundation of the book, and others are unspecific. As for those in whose hearts is deviation from truth, they will follow that of it which is unspecific. Seeking discord and seeking an interpretation suitable to them, and no one knows its true interpretation except Allah. But those firm in knowledge say, we believe in it, all of it is from our Lord, and no one will be reminded except those of understanding. So yet again, God talks directly here and says that only the people of understanding will actually be reminded. But if you look into it, this book has been revealed, all of it, by God. Some verses are specific, other verses are unspecific, and they will be unknown. It says clearly, they will be unknown. But you will have people that will declare that they know the truth and they will seek a certain interpretation to explain you then why it is the truth. Even though though it cannot be known except by Allah. This is clearly what it says here in the word of God. So please let me know what you think about this in the comment section, guys. We have not realizing the origin of the Quran, the original experience of the Quran. You see, when the people first received the Quran, the people of Mecca who were living among this Prophet وسلم, for 40 years without him making any claims, and all of a sudden he claims to have revelation, and he's speaking on behalf of the word of Allah, and he's declaring the word of Allah, and sometimes he would speak on his own as well, meaning Allah would he would be inspired by the wisdom of Allah, but he would be in, in his own words. The thing is, they didn't have what we have today. We have a book called the Quran, and we have other books called books of Hadith, right? And so there's two separate sources. So if you want to study Quran, you open this book. If you want to study, you know, Hadith, you open up Bukhari, Muslim, you know. And you yes, I absolutely know. understand where he is going with this. He wants to claim, of course, that during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad, you had both, basically. You had the revelation of the Quran and you were around the Prophet. Therefore, you had the Hadith, so to speak. You had the real Sunnah present to you. But nevertheless, yet again, I see a temporal argument here. Of course, it was needed for those people at that time. Of course, they needed to accept him as a messenger. Otherwise, Islam would not spread. Moreover, nobody would have memorized the Quran and without it, then we wouldn't have the book. However, yet again, in the book, in the Quran, it says that Muhammad is the messenger, only a messenger. Don't elevate his status like the Christians did with Jesus. And moreover, it says yet again that he is a warner to the people. And therefore, he finished his mission. He finished the job. We have the Quran now. He transmuted the whole message during his lifetime. He gathered a following and this following successfully through the Khalifs, etc., etc., spread the message of Islam and now we are here we still have the Quran this is absolutely beautiful this is a miracle to me for the people that first experienced Islam is this this one man sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's his voice sure when he speaks it's Quran and when he speaks it's sunnah it's yes. actually one they can't even physically separate the two absolutely they can't. for them it's yes. actually one and the same for them and so this point is inc incredibly important. Why didn't Allah just send a separate book? So you could just say, okay, this is the word of God and that's the word of the Prophet والسلام, and let's just keep those entirely separate from each other so they don't, you know, you know, so people know that they have to follow this, but not necessarily that. Allah did not send the Prophet like a delivery service, like, you know, like FedEx or something. Now, okay, now this is downgrading the view of a prophet in itself. Yet again, you had Noah, you had Moses, prophets are sent with a certain message from God. And so did Prophet Muhammad. He got the exalted position of spreading the message of Islam, the message of monotheism across the whole globe via the Quran. You cannot compare this to FedEx, man. UPS. <laughs> and you just UPS. deliver a package and then you don't have, you don't acknowledge the greatness of the delivery guy. 
Of course you, you do. You acknowledge the greatness of all the messengers. Of course you do. You just you appreciate the package, not the deliverer. But that's not the only role of our Prophet In order to clarify the message, what Allah is making clear now is that the Quran had to have been delivered through a living role model. It had. To, it, this is theory, and by itself, it's theory. How do you live this? You need to give. You need to give a living model of this, and the living model was the one teaching it, the one speaking it. That's why it was incredibly important that it be combined. This is actually something the Quraysh complained about. How come paper? Again, I absolutely understand that during this time, where they were surrounded by pagans in the Arab Peninsula, you of course need an example in order to gather a following. Yet again, to establish a following that then will promote the message of Islam. Absolutely, we're on the same page here. But nevertheless, the Quran itself claims that it is crystal clear. And when you read it, man, I come from a Christian background. I don't have any bias here, other than that I hated Islam before reading the Quran. But when I read the Quran, I fell in love with the message of Islam. It was absolutely clear to me and beautiful that we are talking about Tawheed. It was a book of Tawheed. No idol worship any longer. No deifying Jesus. Just focus on God. Just don't come flying be down from me, the sky. Qirtas in rolls of paper just come flying down from the sky. So they can touch those papers with their hands and then realize that this is this is the word of God. Uh, no, that wouldn't make anything clear. When Allah, for example, says you have to be cautious of God, that's generic. How does how do you manifest that in, in, in practicality? You manifest that in the behavior of the Prophet. So ideas, the world of ideas come. I mean, it's kind of crystal clear what it means to be cautious of God. God came with his commandments. He clearly displays what the people of Lut did wrong. So you simply obey his rules and you don't sin. Come to life. These ideas in this book, not the wisdom in this book, comes to life in the character of the Prophet, thus making them inseparable as they always were from the very beginning. The third issue that I briefly want to comment on is the idea that the Quran itself is enough. Like the Quran claims that it is enough. And I, I, I find... Oh, wow, man, this is really crazy to me, I have to say. So he says himself, the Quran claims to be enough. And now he's going to give you an explanation why the Quran, the word of God, is not enough. It's actually pretty interesting that uh, people have a very okay. shallow reading sometimes of the Quran and don't realize when this was said or how this was said. Okay. As a matter of fact, the context of it is entirely different. You walk away with a completely different conclusion. What was asked by them was, no. Lawla uzi alayhi ayatun min rabbihi. In Surah Al-Ankabut, for example, the Quraysh asked, how come no other miracles come to him? Moses received a staff that turns into a snake, or he right. parted water, or Jesus could heal the blind, etc. by God's yep. permission. How come he doesn't show us any special effects? How come he doesn't get any of those miracles? And so Allah said to them, awalam yakfihim, isn't it enough for them that we've sent down the book onto you that is being read onto them for its incredible power and language the Quran itself is a heavier miracle than all of those previous miracles given to prophets combined Allah is making which again would confirm my assumption here that the Quran itself is the miracle that has been transmuted throughout time and now we have access to it it's combined Allah is making the case that this book is enough as a miracle, as an evidence of the truth of the Prophet It's not making the case that the Quran is enough and you don't need any other, you know, you don't need the Prophet himself That wasn't even the, art, the discussion. The discussion was about whether the book is enough as a miracle and absolutely it is more than enough as a miracle. It is more than enough to make a case. And this is something that was evidenced to the Quran. Okay, so this is his interpretation of this ayah. Please let me know in the comment section what you think about this, guys, because yet again, I'm simply hearing his interpretation interpretation here, yeah, how would I verify that this is really true just because he said it? It's a side discussion, but important to bring up here. You know, when I, if I'm, I'm talking to you right now, I, there's no script in front of me. I'm speaking in my own words, right? Stuff that I remember, things that I think about as, as they come in my mind, yeah. I share them with you. If I had a script, especially a script that was written by somebody else, and I was reading it, even if I had memorized it and I was reciting it to you, you'd be able to tell that's not how Norman speaks. I think he's quoting Shakespeare. I think he's quoting some newspaper article. I think he's quoting, you know, because the speech pattern, the way the words are structured, your style, your, you know, everything changes when you're not saying your own words, when you're saying words of someone else.
when you're repeating words of someone else, especially if you're doing them for a long time. Everybody yeah. has basically a speech pattern. When the Prophet ﷺ would speak, people have known him speak for 40 years. And when he would recite the Qur'an, it was not his speech pattern. Exactly the right. Entire this is exactly the impression that I got when I started reading Hadith. They sounded completely different. It was nothing like reading the Qur'an. Reading the Qur'an has a transformative effect on me personally, but reading the Hadith is more like listening to history lessons. The study of Hadith doesn't even come close no. in its style, in, its, in, in, in the way it's organized, even in its vocabulary. Exactly. It's nothing like the Qur'an. It's completely distinguishable from the Qur'an. Yep. So people would look at that, people would hear him speak and say, Wait, those aren't his words. He, no, he never talks like that. As a matter of fact, I don't know anybody who talks like that. They could tell that this is from Allah. And that's the argument being made. Isn't the Quran enough as evidence? Doesn't it raise enough questions? Aren't you baffled by the marvel and the beauty of these words and the, the language that is being delivered to this messenger وسلم, that you can clearly distinguish from his own speech? So that's the third issue. And fourthly, for me, this doesn't work. It takes away the focus from the Quran and onto Prophet Muhammad. It glorifies him, shows how great his character was and why he was in this exalted position to recite the Quran. But this yet again reminds me of Christianity. I come from Christianity. I've seen it before when people glorify a man to such an extent that ultimately in the end they declare him even God. Of course this is not the case thank God within Islam but I said it previously guys everything can become worship. If I am 24 7 on my phone I can declare that I believe in God but I'm still worshiping my phone indirectly. Don't you see this? This is my example that I'm giving here and therefore now I see an obsession yet again of people claiming how grandiose Prophet Muhammad was. And yet again, God rest his soul, may peace be upon him. Absolutely. But nevertheless, this cannot take the focus away from the Quran. You know, really to me, the Quranic argument, the first thing I talked to you guys about is more than enough. And it's more than enough to satisfy the heart of a believer. The Quran's arguments often are spiritual he arguments and they are the most compelling as far as I'm concerned. Now, there's another rational argument that is brought up and that's you know i even if let's just say i want to i want to believe what the prophet had to say sallallahu alaihi wasallam i want to believe hadith i want to believe that the prophet sallallahu wisdom is worthwhile and his his practices his teachings is i on that note i do believe that the practices and teachers are worthwhile don't get me wrong i'm not a quranist in the sense that i'm disregarding all the hadiths all i'm saying is that those hadiths nowadays the way that i perceive it have even authority over the quran or the interpretations that have seen and the hadith seem to have at least the same level like the Quran. And I personally don't understand how this could be accepted at all. You know, his daily rituals, I, I want to learn about hadith. those don't things. Get me wrong. But how am I supposed to trust that these people who narrated these hadith, these who the, the transmitters of this tradition, yeah, who sure. passed it on from That's one person point. to another person to another person, how am I supposed to know that these people are trustworthy, that I can rely on them? You know, because Allah said he protected the Quran. He never said he protected hadith. So how am I supposed to do, you know, to, to, to make do with this? The simple answer to that, even though it's an elaborate, exhaustive academic discussion, and inshallah ta'ala on the Facebook group, I will also put some, some resources for you guys to read. I mean, yet again, to play devil's advocate, you make it to be a intellectual discussion, but nevertheless, God gives the promise of preserving the Quran and not the Hadith. That is a fact. It's but, true. Um, well, what I want you to think about is as follows. The people who transmitted Islam, are the same bunch of people. It's not one group of people that transmitted the Quran and another group of people that transmitted Hadith. These companions were entrusted with transmitting the word of Allah and the teachings of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the next generation, which passed it down to the next. Sure, the only skepticism that comes into place here is of course that we had forgeries when it comes down to Hadith. This is a fact, you can look it up, it truly happened. However, we don't have any forgeries when it comes down to Quran. Which passed it down to the next. The Quran itself is originally an oral tradition. Yep. It's predominantly an oral tradition. The writing of it, the, 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 you know, the coming together of it is actually a formality that was necessary down the road. But originally, ayatun bayinatun fi sudur al ladina utul ilm. Quran itself will declare these are miraculous signs lying in the chests of those who've been given knowledge. Overwhelmingly, people around the world, hundreds of thousands of people, memorized the Quran within the first generation. 
That's exactly. how the Quran actually spread. And that's actually how the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ actually spread. Originally, through these reliable people, the same people we rely on for the Quran. What I'm saying is, Allah did when Allah said He will protect the Quran, He didn't send us some box from the sky that the Quran came in and you couldn't touch it anymore. He used people of reliable chests to preserve the Quran. And it's those very people that have brought us this sure, tradition. absolutely. And moreover, he chose a style, of course, that can be easily memorized. If you look into the patterns of the Quran, you will see that it is so easy to memorize that even non-Arab speaking Muslims can memorize it without even understanding what they are reciting. The same cannot be said for the Hadith. Incredible tradition of the Prophet Yes, it requires rigor to find out whether or not a statement is actually attributed to him. Yeah. Just like it required rigor as a matter of fact. And the rigor was applied to even the Quran, even every ayah of the Quran. The tawatur is always there. It's actually the same principles were actually applied to the Quran itself. So questioning hadith, actually, then you actually end up questioning Quran itself. Nah, because it is on, coming man. from the same come historical on, tradition. He's so creating now a at the end of here. all That's of this, fair. what I want to share with you is the other extreme as I close. And the other extreme is, we believe in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ just as we believe in the Qur'an and we see them as inseparable from each other. I would even say that the first tafsir of the Qur'an, the first explanation and the application of the Qur'an is the living model of the Prophet ﷺ. The disservice, however, is when you look at anything, the Book of Allah or the Sunnah of the Messenger ﷺ in a shallow way. In other words, you read a hadith somewhere, a translation, a shallow translation of a hadith somewhere, some tradition, you don't know the context, you don't know who the Prophet was talking to ﷺ, you don't know what transpired thereafter, you didn't dig deeper into what actually the entire context of the speech is and you start drawing all kinds of conclusions. This is a problem. This is why the hadith sciences are, a, it's a sensitive science, just like Quranic studies is, it's a sensitive science. I've learned over the last you know few years that the more you respect context, the more, the better your understanding gets and the more disregarding you are of context. You know, the way you just don't even acknowledge what's what did Allah say before? What did he say after? Even textual context. I'm not even saying historical context. Sure, I agree. Even textual context. If you pluck things out from the middle of a conversation, you're not going to understand what was wholly being said. Allah did say the book is clear, but that doesn't mean that it's overly simple. In order to have clarity. No, just as I said in the ayah before, no, it is not overly simple. Some passages are vague and they won't be understood by anybody than God. You have to apply your mind. It's important. Allah expects human beings to reflect on the book. Yeah. It's not going to come that you just open the book, read something. Oh, it should be clear to me. Why isn't it clear to me? Well, you know, mathematics is very clear, but that doesn't mean that it's simple. Physics is very clear for people who study physics. That doesn't mean that it's simple. There's a difference between clarity and simplicity. The book of Allah and the deen of Islam certainly is clear. And some parts of it, as a matter of fact, are simple too. But the Quran actually never uses the word simple. It always uses the word clear and clarifying. Yep. And in order to arrive at clarity, one has to apply their mind. And that's why Allah constantly asks believers, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Why don't you apply your intellect? Why don't they reflect? Why don't they think deeply? This exactly. is something expected of us. The one time Allah says Quran is easy. I would absolutely agree here. This is expected of us. We should use our reason. We should use our intellect. So if we listen to certain scholars and obey it as the absolute truth without reflecting ourselves, we are doing the Quran a disservice. The one time he repeats it. Quran is easy in the same surah. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا We made the Quran easy. We made the Quran easy. We made the Quran easy. But he actually qualified that statement too. He said, For recitation. We, we made it easy for the, for, for the purpose of remembrance. Yep. As a spiritual text, as a spiritual source, it's been made easy. So for you to remember Allah, the easiest way to do so is recite the word of Allah. In that sense, it was made easy. So don't oversimplify or paint, you know, paint with broad strokes the statements in the Quran and then come away with dangerous conclusions. May Allah Azza wa make us acknowledge the status of our great messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his role and his inseparable and his priceless role in us developing the proper understanding and inshallah ta'ala an application of the book of Allah throughout our lives. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Thanks so much and I hope you do you, you guys join the Facebook group for some healthy conversation.
All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. Very long as it is, so I'm going to cut it off here. Just a last statement. He ended his presentation with saying to dangerous conclusions. Which dangerous conclusions are those? That we believe that the Quran is the word of God, that the word of God declares that there is no God worthy of worship but one God, that this book clearly displays where the errors of the people of the past were, that they fell into sin, into sodomy, etc., and we should not repeat the same mistakes is this really the dangerous conclusion that somebody can come to okay then i'm guilty as charged all right guys but this is it for today's video if you liked it leave the thumbs up if you haven't subscribed already guys please do so and if you want to support this channel via patreon for example guys thank you so much to my patrons for the ongoing support then all the links are in the description box below as always guys may god bless you all much love and peace